Right, hello everyone. Thank you for that uh, very w uh, warm welcome and uh, and welcome as well to uh, Michael Roberts from Copper and Jack Yang from LTP. Gentlemen, how are you both? Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. Hello. Oh. Might, be on, might, might need a handheld again, sorry. Um, so we're here to discuss uh, navigating opportunities through custom prime services, which we're going to condense into the next 19 minutes and 32 seconds. Um, so a uh, big ranging topic. Um, I th I'll come to you uh, first, uh, Jack. We will start by exploring a few points around the emerging opportunities and challenges in uh, digital asset prime brokerage services. So. From your experiences, um, what are some of the most um, in-demand features and capabilities that crypto funds are looking for in a prime brokerage services? And, and, and what, what are the pain points that they're most looking to solve? Okay, thank you for your question. Yes, uh, these days we see a lot of institutions they come to a prime broker and want to search for a better choice for their trading infra. Uh, I think from our side, we see some trend uh, and we, we see some features attractive them to use a prime rock. First off, they want to find um, um, like more uh, if, uh, like cost effective trading solutions in the bear market, in the, in the, in the bear markets, everyone want to decline the cost, especially for the HFD firm and upcharge firm. They want to, like have a lower cost and want to grab the, some opportunity faster than some competitors. So they want to find a lower cost trading solution. The second one, they want to find a, a more fund efficiency. If you have a higher strategy, you want to e improve your efficiency after you can borrow from borrow fund from the Prime broker, you can get leverage from Prime broker. Also, if you want to trade in multiple exchanges, you can access to the different value of gas, different liquidity with the Prime service. I think the the third one maybe it will be the most important since we can the Prime broker can make the the funds access to different liquidity with lower counterparty risk. Nowadays, everyone concerned about the counterparty risk when uh, after FTS crash, when they using a new exchange on board a new platform, they want to know what risk they are taking. So when they trading in Prime Broker, they can learn from Prime Broker and decline the decline the counterparty risk. Also, Prime Broker can communicate can cooperation with some custodian like Copper. And we can provide, we can uh, cooperate together to provide a off exchange, provide a like uh, your fund can be storage on the third party, third party custodian and trade on the different exchanges. It will make the things more transparent and more safer that to, to the client. So we think Prime Broker can combine the, the third party custodian, like some auditor, some the other service together to make it can be a one-stop solution for the trading infra, for the trade for the traders. So we are doing it and we want to be, we want to promote a healthy trading infra with some partners like Copper. Mm. Uh, thanks for that, Jack. Uh, so picking up from that point, uh, Michael, in terms of, you know, as it were, being a one-stop one shop, can you give some points um, from how custodians such as Copper can effectively integrate with and support some of these emerging sectors beyond trading, staking and lending, uh, anything around decentralized finance and so on? So what are the sort of the technical and operational challenges um, to, that, that would enable your your clients in the in the custodian world to to participate in these in a secure way yeah um for us like we deal with institutional clients only so you know from a staking perspective we we have connections through to staking partners and then in a recent trend we've seen is some of our biggest clients have asked us to spin up staking nodes that are you know, run by copper so 
you know, we don't have a huge coverage in that space. We do it selectively at client demand. So that is more to keep it all in house so that, you know, they feel comfortable with the way we do things and our reporting and all that type of stuff. So, you know, the staking side of things is a partnership, you know, potentially between, you know, the, the, the staking providers on the street and client demand on our side. Mm. DeFi is very, very interesting because, you know, I stress the point that, you know, we're institutional and that's, that's who we deal with. So we've seen a trend and we're working with a couple of the big protocols where, They'd like us to build a clear loop type solution for DeFi. Now, what we mean by that is, you know, more and more hedge funds and, and players in this space are interested in DeFi, but what they can't do is raise capital or use proprietary capital, put it into DeFi, and then there's a hack. Um, it will blow their fund up. It will ruin their reputation, et cetera. So, you know, as Jack quite rightly said, you know, we have solutions uh, in the centralized space to hold the assets off exchange mm -hmm. and let the prime brokers do their thing with the exchanges and, and the clients. But... We're now working on solutions where that, you know, that initial capital that's deployed in, in, in DeFi would again be held at copper and we're working with protocols to do that. So it's not something I can go into detail at the moment, but there's, 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 two, uh, there's two solutions we're working on to try and you know, give that institutional feel to DeFi. Mm. And then picking up from that, could you elaborate, um, bear in mind what you just said about mm. the, the limitation of how much you can say, but um, elaborate maybe a bit on how Prime brokerage can help crypto funds um, improve that capital efficiency and yeah. returns through through leveraging assets in custody. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, prime brokerage in in crypto is is uh, it's like it's three or four counterparties coming together to provide the service. You know, I come from a traditional prime background, and that's usually one big bank like you know uh, Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan providing all the services, trading, clearing, financing, etc. So, you know, the, the best solutions we've got in crypto at the moment are firms like LTP and the lending community in general um, coming to someone like Copper that has, you know, secure custody, fast custody. But most importantly, you know, we've come up with the innovation of having these assets held in a trust, right? So. The only reason we've managed to get the exchanges to, you know, sign up to Clearloop and clients to be comfortable with it is everyone needs to be on a level playing field. Mm. And the trust structure, you know, it's 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 uh, English law designed by Linklaters. It allows the clients a safe place to trade, so they can trade there. But another, the next part of the conundrum we need to solve because market structure's broken since uh, since all the events of last year is, you know, like lending needs to come back to the market. You know, this is where Jack comes in. And lending needs to be done in a safe way. So, you know, we're integrating with LTP to make sure everything that they do, they can, you know, um, lend into the Clearloop Trust. So it's not just exchange connectivity. That's there and safe. The oxygens for hedge funds to grow and obviously, um, you know, deploy capital and put the, um, build the outsized returns is lending. So we're pivoting quite hard now to work with the lending community, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's LTP or other lenders that are naturally long crypto, uh, or stable coins, et cetera, to say, look, bring your assets to copper. It's your lending. Um, it's your balance sheet. We're not going to lend, but we have all the rails in place for you to do it in a safe way. I'd say the last thing is, you know, Prime Brokerage has two models in the traditional space. It has a derivatives intermediation model, which is the current prevalent model in, in crypto. It's, it's good, it's quick, and, but you're taking counterparty risk to exchanges, et cetera. You know, what really needs to happen in this space is collateralized lending. So, you know, mm. again, safe place to lend. Then we bring in the collateralized aspect of it that allows these books to grow kind of infinitely then, which is what goes on in the traditional space. Because all the loans, all the loans are collateralized. Mm. Some point that pops up quite a bit in sort of things I would cover at Coindesk and, and one of the, what I'm, I might refer to as a bit of a bellwether of the evolution of digital assets is, is the extent to which um, it, if we're looking at mainstream adoption, from big players in the traditional financial world, what are the things that they would expect to find that they would that are part and parcel of their business in the traditional in traditional finance? Mm -hmm. And it and one of the things that's increasingly been been popping up. I mean, example of state of vested interest from something we do at CoinDesk is is our indices business, which is something which would be absolutely central to to investment and trading in in tradfi. But I think custody, um, prime custody is is certainly one as well. So come back to you. Uh, Jack, can you tell us a bit about how the, the, the landscape of crypto prime brokerage is evolving to meet the needs of um, the, or the, the, the needs of sort of sophisticated trading firms and asset managers? Um, and what new services offer, what new services are emerging to meet those needs? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, 
I think we can get a lot of experience from the trade file. Yes, when you're trading in in US stock market or in, in FS market, you have a prime block to address all the counterparty risk. And you can access to different liquidity values with with your account just have in prime block. So in crypto, we also have different liquidity pools, different different exchanges, different OCC desks, also have some ECNs coming out. When you're trading, trading with this platform, you must separate all the margin into different platforms. It's very low efficient. And our final aim is want to set up a unified interface, unified account, you can put all the capital together and you can access to different liquidity exchange, OTC desk, both sex and dex, you can get benefit from their liquidity, but your capital is a storage on, on the safer place, like some custodian or some smart contract for different users, and you can put all the things together and you can loan in one, you can maybe you can loan on Vines and short on OKX and you can get a lower collateral requirement. What the prime, prime broker thing do? Uh, I think the most important thing for a prime broker is address the risk control and partner with the custodian to, to do the clearing. So it will benefit all the all the different tra trading scenarios. Hmm. Thanks, Jared. Um, and then come back to you, uh, Michael. Just following on for that a little bit. What do you think it would take? It takes to sort of build institutional grade um, custody sol solutions and services that that would instill confidence in in large investors. Um, I mean, look, you've got to be quick. Um, you've got to be secure. That's kind of a given. So if you, if you know, the, the transactions can't be signed quick enough to then, you know, settle with the exchanges, that's going to be a problem. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, it's legal agreements now that, you know, make sense to TradFi and then technical enforceability of those legal agreements and things like the trust structure. You know, we're dealing with very different instruments here and Jack's right, you know, a prime broker, a traditional prime broker that can take assets you know, net them and all those types of things, the assets are sitting in custody in their custody accounts at the prime broker. You know, because these are bearer instruments and the way the, the industry kind of grew up with assets being traded on exchange, et cetera, it, it kind of made it a difficult place to, to do prime brokerage, but slowly but surely, you know, we're working together and, you know, the smart firms in this space, we're, we're doing a lot of partnerships because, you know, there is no JP Morgan that's going to be the prime broker behind this. So we're doing smart partnerships to bring together a situation where a prime like LTP or some of the other primes on the street, Matrix, Port, et cetera, can look at a pool of assets in a trust structure, bankruptcy remote to copper, and then do that optimization. So I think that's important. And then those rails, once they're safe, you know, an institutional player will look at all of that. These are tri-party agreements that they agree with copper, you know, with a prime broker, with an exchange, et cetera. So as long as that agreement holds together, it's enforceable by law. And then the innovation that crypto has, and we have to press on these things, is technical enforceability through the key shards. Um, you don't have that in traditional finance. It's all about legal agreements and, you know, trusting the entity you're dealing with. Um, the last thing I'd say is, you know, you know, and this is an important aspect to it because we need to pivot the industry to a, a state where we're talking about the innovations of blockchain. Um, you know, last month, our, our Clearloop product settled um, 8,275 risk-reducing settlements between us and the exchange. Now, if you take that to traditional markets, most exchanges do a margin call once a day. Um, and it's on a T plus one basis. And, you know, everyone in the room will know what happened with Robinhood and GameStop and them not having enough money to fund their margin call. This is happening every four hours, right? So that is a massive innovation in the space. And, you know, that's, that's what we're excited about is partnering with the right firms and building things like that where we can go back to traditional finance and say, listen, this is how it should be done. And if you can take Ethereum and, and replace that with a tokenized equity or a bond, why is it not going to work the same? So we're actually doing things that are more innovative than the traditional market, but we have to lend and learn lessons from that market as well. Mm. And then Jack, 
picking up from Michael's point there about tokenization, um, and again from from the infrastructure perspective, um, can you give us some thoughts about the, the adoption of sort of that that integration between digital and traditional ecosystems to allow um, the, the enable the tokenization of 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 assets. Yeah, I, we we also seen some interesting things related to tokenization. We have some dialogue with the trade five banks. They are they are doing the tokenization of gold. Also, some tokenization with T bill. Why we have a lot of interest in in T bill? Why we can Add TBL into our ecosystem. You can put your farm in your bank, and you can buy the TBL. Also, this TBL can be the collateral can be traded on different exchanges. So your return will will plus TBL together. So you can get a higher year than TBL. With also you can benefit from your strategy. These things you can. You can like uh, get a high efficiency when you trade in crypto. Also, we have some dialogue with the bank. They want to tokenize the gold, and we see a lot of in we see a improved need to to gold. They want to hold gold to to, to diversify their their portfolio. But why you can not buy a like tokenized gold? Also, you can trade on on some some exchanges. It also can benefit from different assets. I think crypto the 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 maximum strength is it can be designed. It can can it can be a it's a pocket can add more and more assets together, and you can. Maximum the efficiency when you're dealing with the different assets. I think for our our role, we want to be the bridge with the trade file asset and crypto asset. We want to combine them together. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. And and then one uh, final point, which you've sort of touched on Michael it is I think your your wording was there is no JP Morgan there is no Goldman Sachs mm. is are you saying that there is a lot of space for consolidation in this space is it a little bit fragmented to time in and is it is it through partnerships like like between copper and LTP yep. or is it more um is it more um um uh, more tangible um consolidation through M&A etc um, could be a bit of the latter, but I mean, you know, when you don't have a big bank with trading capabilities, clearing, you know, big balance sheets, etc., you know, sensibility tells you, you know, let's let's do smart partnerships, let's take the best in breed custody, let's take the best in breed access to exchanges, um, uh, you know, prime brokerage services, etc., and and put together a smart partnership that you know institutional clients will recognize and use and if we're smart about it that is what will introduce you know and, and encourage the banks to come across alongside a regulation of course but um you know we, there, there is just no one in crypto of the size of these big banks that can service the hedge fund industry in the way that it does in traditional markets so you know it stands to reason that you have to be sensible and and, and do the right partnerships i mean i would agree with jack you know a big trend i would see over the next 12 to 18 months is you know, tokenization of real world assets has happened. If you speak to the big banks, it's not about proving you can tokenize. It's now doing something with that asset. Can you lend it? Can you repo it? Can you do something with that asset? So to Jack's point, if someone's a natural long gold holder, one of his clients is a long gold holder, you've got gold sitting stored in physical vaults. Why not tokenize that? Put a legal agreement over the top of it saying it's now a lien to LTP for the loan they've done on the exchange. All of a sudden, you have a more sustainable and a, a business in the prime brokerage space you can grow that's not predicated around counterparty risk, right? Because that's credit risk. The current model is credit risk. There is no credit risk when you've got you know the collateral in place with the appropriate haircuts, margin calls happening regularly, etc. So look, we can build the, the the ecosystem with the players that are out there, and then longer term, when the regulations kick in, you actually can put a model in place where the banks look at it and go, oh, that feels familiar. It, it you know the the model that we had. In the last uh, bull cycle, didn't feel familiar to any bank, 
Um, so you know, I think we're I think we're slowly getting to a much better place in terms of market structure for clients to trade. We're not in a good place in terms of market structure from a liquidity perspective. Lending needs to come back. The ETF needs to be approved, et cetera, et cetera. So institutional adoption goes beyond, as a, as a, as a point of summing up, because we're out of time already. It's, it's fine. Anyway. Um, institutional adoption isn't just if, if, if large financial institutions see some sort of future in crypto. It's when they can... Re they see crypto as something that is comparable to what they understand and yeah. what they recognize, what they would trust. Yeah, I would agree. It's, it, I mean, look, there's, there's changes and innovations in the space. As I said, you know, things like clearing our risk every four hours is capital efficient. It reduces counterparty risk, but they have to have something that feels relatable. If it's too far off, and that's why DeFi for the banks is they're interested, but it's way, way off at the moment. It needs to feel something that they can, you know, take a logical stepping stone towards it. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you for your uh, your attention. Thank you, gentlemen, um, for a, for your insight and a very interesting panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.